We're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 28 today, verses 1 through 17. Jeremiah 28, verses 1 through 17. Recently read an, an amazing story out of the Valdosta Daily Times, which happened back in 2011. In that year, there was a deadly string of tornadoes that ripped through the state of Alabama, which killed somewhere around 250 people. And in the middle of that storm, there was a family of 13 who apparently ran out of time while seeking shelter, so they ran into a heavily wooded area, and they tied a couple of their younger kids around some trees while the older members held on to each other and, and some of the other trees for dear life. And the family said that as, that, as those tornadoes were going through the area, they saw decades-old trees uh, getting ripped out of the ground, yet somehow uh, they were all okay after the storm had passed. Imagine for a moment, imagine that scenario. You're in the middle of this massive storm, um, and uh, as you are in the middle of that, that storm, that storm would represent, those tornadoes would represent false teachers and teaching, and, and the tree that you're hanging on to represents the Word of God. If you're If you're out there in that storm, you're hanging on for dear life. You're hanging on to that tree. And as believers, we need to be those who are clinging on to the Word of God because we're living in a time where false messages and false teachers abound. And I think the problem is if we don't view ourselves as those who are out in the middle of a storm when in reality we are, we we make ourselves susceptible uh, to some of that. We live in an ocean of uh, Christian podcasts, Christian bestsellers, and, and Christian studies that tamper with the Word of God. And it's interesting what Moses would write in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, before the Israelites went into the promised land. In 4, verse 2, we read this, You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. And the message was clear. Do not add or take away from God's word. In chapter 13, verse 32, we read, Whatever I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to nor take away from it. And of course, this clearly is seen throughout Scripture. In Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6, we read this, Every word of God is tested. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. Do not add to His words, or He will reprove you, and you will be proved a liar. And what we're going to see today as we open up to Jeremiah chapter 8 is we're going to see this proverb right here, Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 and 6, really fleshed out in the text that we'll be looking at. Chapter 28, Jeremiah chapter 28. Uh, verses 1 through 17. We're going to read those verses together. Let's uh, dive right into this text today, and then we'll, we'll uh, dig a little bit deeper here. We'll begin in verse 1. Please read along with me. Now in the same year, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah king of Judah, in the fourth year, in the fifth month, Hananiah, the son of Azur, the prophet, who was from Gibeon, spoke to me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests, And all the people saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, I am going to bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. I am also going to bring back to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, And all the exiles of Judah who went to Babylon declares the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and in the presence of all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord confirm your words, which you have prophesied to bring back the vessels of the Lord's house and all the exiles from Babylon to this place. Yet hear now this word which I am about to speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people, the prophets who were before me and before you from ancient times, prophesied against many lands and against great kingdoms of war and of calamity and of pestilence 
the prophet who prophesies of peace when the word of the prophet comes to pass. Then that prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke from the neck of Jeremiah the prophet and he broke it. Verse 11, Hananiah spoke in the presence of all the people saying, Thus says the Lord, even so will I break within uh, two full years the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all the nations. Then the prophet Jeremiah went his way. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Go and speak to Hananiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, You have broken the yokes of wood, but you have made instead of them yokes of iron. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron on the neck of all these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they will serve him. And I have also given him the beasts of the field. Then Jeremiah the prophet said to Hananiah the prophet, Listen now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, And you have made this people trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am about to remove you from the face of the earth. This year you are going to die because you have counseled rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died in the same year in the seventh month. It's a pretty dramatic uh, scene that we have here. Um, We have this false prophet, Hananiah. And as I was reading through this chapter and studying it, I think that it's a bit. I think that it will be a bit surprising to us to see how intense uh, this moment was for Jeremiah. It's quite shocking, really, to read of an account like this. But then again, we shouldn't be shocked. Remember, where God is at work, Satan is there to oppose it. And when we open up to a chapter like Jeremiah chapter twenty-eight, it's pretty clear that it is serious business before God when one decides to tamper with his word. It's serious business before God when one decides to tamper with his word. Hananiah is going to do just that. He's going to tamper with the word of God. And from this passage today, we're going to find four situations that will transpire in this text. But before we get to those four situations, I want to look at that first verse and do a little bit of a recap here and really dive into that message that Hananiah had uh, so that we can better understand what's going on here. Hananiah was a false prophet here in this passage. He certainly could walk the walk and talk the talk, uh, but at the end of the day, his message was a phony message. It was a scam, and the people loved him for it. They did. Uh, well, let's, let's look at that first verse. It says, Now in the same year, in the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year, in the fifth month. Uh, and, and what is being communicated here is that these events that will begin to play out are connected to the events in the last chapter. Well, if you'll remember from that 27th chapter, God had very specific Uh, had a very specific message to three groups of people at that time in history. In chapter 27, God had Jeremiah speak to his people. He had Jeremiah speak to the king. He had Jeremiah speak to the Gentile nations about the reality of the situation before them, that if they would submit to King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, that they would find freedom there. And God's message to the world at that time was that if they wanted to live, if they wanted God's blessing, And if they didn't want to be cursed, then they needed to come under the yoke of Babylon. And God had Jeremiah communicate this message in a very unique way. Does anybody remember how Jeremiah was to communicate that message? He was to do so with a yoke, right? You remember that yoke? Um, He was to preach to the people wearing a yoke around his head. And the contents of this message... Uh, the contents were very clear given in chapter 27. Let's go back to Jeremiah 27, verse 16, just by way of reminder for a moment. I'd encourage you to follow follow along in your Bibles. You can also follow along on the PowerPoint up here. Um, But I believe it's important that we do a quick review of God's message to his people from the last chapter. In chapter 27, verse 16, God wanted his people to understand that there were false prophets. There were false prophets in their midst. 
And his word to them was, do not listen to those false prophets. You remember that. Do not listen to those false prophets. In chapter 27, verse 17, God clearly wanted his people to come under the yoke of Babylon. Then in verse 22 of chapter 27, uh, God said that all the vessels of the Lord's house would be um, brought into Babylon. And then in, and finally in chapter um, 22, if we go back a bit more, uh, chapter 22, verse 27, I have these verse references up here for you. God said to King Jehoiachin that he would never again return to Judah after he had been taken captive by the Babylonians. I'm going to leave this up here because we're going to see that this, is, this was what God was communicating to his people. And Hananiah's message that he brings will contradict God's message. It's going to contradict it. But from this, um, from this first verse, we're given a, a detailed explanation into Hananiah's background. It's stated here that he's the son of Azur and was from Gibeon. Gibeon was about six miles northwest of Jerusalem. And it was also known for being a priestly town, kind of like Jeremiah's hometown. And what all of this shows us is this, that Hananiah had a, repu- had a reputation. The people in Judah, they knew this man. They supported this man. They loved the messages that came out of this guy. And that leads us to the first situation uh, that we find in this passage. Hananiah tampers with God's word in verses 2 through 4. And notice with me just where he is when he tampers with the word of God. In verse 1, Towards the end of the verse, we read that he spoke to Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. You'll note that, in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and all the people. So this this false prophet is in the temple of God, and this is what he says, verses 2 through 4. Let's read that together. Uh, Verse 2, thus says the Lord of hosts, this is Hananiah speaking, The God of Israel, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, I'm going to bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. I am also going to bring back to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and all the exiles of Judah, who went to Babylon, declares the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. And notice with me just how much uh, his message contradicted the message that God gave to Jeremiah. I mean, here Jeremiah, he gets done, he's, he gets done speaking to the people about the message that God gave to him. And out comes Hananiah with his own predictions concerning the future. And notice with me how he starts out here. Hananiah says, thus says the Lord of hosts. That's how he starts out. Hananiah. Thus says the Lord of hosts. I mean, this guy, he looks authentic. His message to God's people, it's popular, it's persuasive. And this guy, for illustration's sake, um, he taught the people about the power of positive thinking, if you will. Uh, His message about the future was bright. Yet he had nothing to say about sin. He had nothing to say about repentance or about God's judgment. And if we were in the temple listening to this guy speak, I, I think that we would, wanna, we would want to believe Hananiah's message. It sounds good. We'd want to believe it. We'd want to believe it because it sounds, it's a good message. Jeremiah's message stated that God's people needed to submit to, king ba- to the king of Babylon. Jeremiah's message was that the vessels in the temple would be carried away into Babylon until after that 70 years of captivity, and that King Jehoiachin would never come back to Judah. Quite honestly, Jeremiah's message is depressing. It's depressing. Who wants to believe that? It's depressing. It didn't tickle the ears of his listeners. It didn't give them a feel, a good feeling after they heard him speak, but it was truly the word of God. Uh, when it comes to false messages, we need to understand that those, those types of messages might sound good. They might make you feel good. They may even give you a false hope concerning the future. But reality is, in every 
false message, it is the Word of God that is being tampered with. In every false message, the Word of God is what is ultimately being tampered with. And that's what takes place here. Hananiah tampered with God's Word. You know, there are pastors today who tamper with the Word of God. There are whole ministries and movements that sound good, they look good, and yet they tamper with the Word. There are YouTube videos and podcasts that are more concerned with growing a following than they are actually expounding upon the Word of God. And the worst part is believers can get caught up in these things. We can believe these things if we're not careful. We can begin to believe um, messages where the Word is being tampered. So we need to be so careful. We need to be on guard. And that leads us to the second situation here. Jeremiah confronts false teaching, verses 5 through 9. Jeremiah confronts false teaching. Let's look at verse 5. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and in the presence of all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. Now, it's one thing to be here this morning reading this text. But you have to understand, Jeremiah is being challenged openly and publicly, and I can imagine he probably didn't want this kind of attention brought on him. He didn't ask for it. Jer- Jeremiah certainly didn't like how Han- Hananiah was approaching the situation, but because Hananiah opened the door, uh, Jeremiah had to address it. And so he confronts this false teaching. Look with me, verse 6. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord confirm your words, which you have prophesied, to bring back the vessels of the Lord's house and all the exiles from Babylon to this place. I mean, uh, at first glance, it almost seems as though Jeremiah is giving Hananiah his approval, right? That's not what he's doing here. He's not condoning uh, Hananiah's message. Jeremiah simply started out his rebuttal to Hananiah's message by stating, that even he would wish that this message was true. Um, I remember when uh, Katie and I were at Frontier, our um, senior year at Frontier School of the Bible, I would drive 45 minutes to Nebraska working a job. In that drive time, um, I remember tuning into a radio program where there was a false prophet by the name of Harold Camping. I don't know if any of you remember this, uh, but Harold Camping would, would go online, he went on the radio, and his message was that the rapture would take place on May 21st, 2011. And I remember at the time thinking to myself, well, that would be pretty cool. I want to believe that. That would be pretty sweet. Uh, that was our gradu- graduation year, 2011. Um, in fact, I think one family packed up from... Um, New York and left and went to California so they could be the first ones raptured. Left his job, sold their house, everything, so they could be the first ones raptured. Never happened. Um, And uh, Jeremiah, of course, he knew what Hananiah was saying here. He wasn't condoning, he wasn't supporting Hananiah's message, but he's saying if, if this is going to happen, then this is good news. Okay, that's, that's really where he goes with that. Verse 7, Yet hear now this word which I am about to speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who were before me and before you from ancient times prophesied against many lands and against great kingdoms of war and of calamity and of pestilence. In other words, Jeremiah is saying here that he isn't the only true prophet to proclaim that God's judgment is coming. There were many other true prophets prophets who prophesied of this coming calamity for God's people. One of my commentaries says this, the trouble with false prophets was that they always predicted prosperity unconditionally. It is always less popular to predict calamity rather than prosperity. But in the end, time would prove to be a valuable asset to the prophet who is truly from God, which is the point that Jeremiah makes in In verse 9, look with me there, the prophet who prophesies of peace. When the word of of the prophet comes to pass, then that prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. 
In essence, Jeremiah says to Hananiah, when this time of prosperity comes, then we will all know that you are speaking truth, Hananiah. But if the opposite happens and my words come to pass, then it will be known to us all that you, Hananiah, are in fact a liar. And of course, as you can imagine, Hananiah didn't like that. He didn't want to hear that, and so things escalate here. And in fact, Hananiah is going to strongly oppose God's truth in verses 10 and 11. Now, again, remember, Jeremiah is in this yoke, okay? He's been preaching these messages with this yoke on him. And as he's in this yoke, God's people are present with Jeremiah and with Hananiah in the temple. Jeremiah gave the people his message. Then Hananiah comes along and he completely contradicts everything that Jeremiah had just laid out there. Um, And so Jeremiah confronted him about that. And this is where things get heated up a bit. Jeremiah is standing there in the presence of God's people along with this heretic and is... And uh, Jeremiah is as cool as a cucumber. Hananiah loses it. He loses it in two ways. He's going to oppose God's truth in two ways here. Number one, he is going to break God's object lesson. He broke God's object lesson in verse 10. Look with me, verse 10. It says, Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke from the neck of Jeremiah the prophet and broke it. This yoke is probably made of wood. I don't know... Um, how he would have broken this, but the text says that he did. And, uh, and he did so forcefully. It was evident to all in the temple. Uh, and this is quite a scene. H.A. Ironside used to say that error is generally insistent and dogmatic. It's generally insistent and dogmatic. He also broke God's message before the people. Verse 11. He broke God's message before the people. Verse 11, Hananiah spoke in the presence. And he takes that yoke off Jeremiah, breaks it in half, and in the presence of the people he says, Thus says the Lord, even so I will break within two full years the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all the nations. Then the prophet Jeremiah went his way. So this message that Hananiah gave, again, went completely against the message that Jeremiah gave to the Gentile nations in Jeremiah chapter 27, and, and it appeared as though Hananiah had won. It really did. Now, I, I wasn't there, but I don't think it's too much of a stretch to suggest that when Jeremiah left, uh, the people probably cheered. The priests were patting Hananiah on the back. Uh, they gave him their approval while the people rejoiced. Uh, Hananiah was popular with the people because he gave them what they wanted to hear. And his message was, we don't need to submit to King Nebuchadnezzar. And neither do other nations. God's going to bless us. Our nation's going to be healed. He's going to give us wealth. He's going to give us health. He's going to make us prosperous. God is a loving God and He wants us to live our best lives now, right? It's probably what he was saying. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm reading a little bit into the text there. But it brings us to the fourth situation that transpires in this passage. God deals with this false prophet in verses 13 and through 17, or in verses 12 through 17, rather. In verse 12, we read, and we'll read through verse 14 here, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, go and speak to Hananiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, you have broken the yokes of wood, but you have made instead of them yokes of iron. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron on the neck of all these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, that they will serve him. And I have also given him the beasts of the field. When Hananiah tampered with the word of God, He set himself on course to receive the judgment of God. His message didn't come true, nor would it come true. And to demonstrate this reality, God gave, God had Jeremiah make for himself a yoke of iron. And the false prophets in Judah, they couldn't break a yoke iron. So when Jeremiah went back into the temple, the people have known that God wasn't messing around. And when Hananiah tampered with the Word of God, he was essentially tampering with the will of God. And 
And listen, when we tamper with the will of God, that's serious business in the eyes of God. After Hananiah said that the yoke of Babylon would be destroyed in two years, God says in verse 14, I have put a yoke of iron on the neck of all these nations that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they what? And they will, they will serve him. They will. Now, Hananiah's message couldn't thwart God's plans. They couldn't. And I find it fascinating that God had Jeremiah make a yoke of iron after this episode in the temple. Don't forget it. It is always the case that when we reject the light yoke of God's will, we end up wearing a heavier yoke in our own making. When we reject the light yoke of God's will, we end up wearing a heavier yoke in our own making. Jeremiah started out with a yoke of wood. But when the people refused his message, he came back to them with a yoke, and it was a much heavier yoke. God, in essence, was saying, you're not going to break my yoke. Look with me, verse 15. Then Jeremiah the prophet said to Hananiah the prophet, Listen now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, and you have made this people trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am about to remove, remove you from the face of the earth. This year you are going to die, because you have counseled rebellion against the Lord. This is serious business. Hananiah had visibly, publicly attacked God's prophet, and he visibly and verbally proclaimed things that were not in line with God's word nor his will. And we finally read in verse 17, So Hananiah the prophet died in the same year, in the seventh month. Now from the first verse, Hananiah went uh, against Jeremiah in the temple in King Zedekiah's fourth year and fifth month. Verse 17 says that this prophet died in the seventh month, so just two short months later, God judges Hananiah. And, and look, um, after looking at all these situations here, when we saw that Hananiah tampered with the word of God, when God's people refused to listen to Jeremiah's rebuttal, and when Hananiah then strongly opposed God's truth, it was then that God dealt with this false prophet. So we come back to the main truth that we see in chapter 28, and it is this, that it is serious business before God when one decides to tamper with his word. As we finish up our time together, I want us to come back to Proverbs chapter 30. If you would turn back there with me, chapter 30 of Proverbs. Um, I mentioned that we, we kind of, in a sense, we see this proverb play out in chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 30. We opened up our time with this, verses 5 and 6. I just love how a simple reading of this text, it parallels so well with what we've just looked at. In verse 5, it says, every word of God is tested. It doesn't matter what year you're living in. It doesn't matter what's going on politically in any nation. God's word is absolutely relevant for all people at all times. And even though we have been bombarded with false messages and false teachers, verse 5 goes on to say, He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. And He is just that. But for those who do not take refuge in the Lord, and they claim to have a message from God when they don't, then they are standing in line to receive the righteous judgment of God. And there are, I believe, a few lessons that we can take away from a passage like this. Number one, I believe we can um, take this away as we look at this text here. If, if you are slandering faithful people who serve God and are faithfully standing on his word, then you do not have God's blessing in life. We see that very clearly in chapter 28. Hananiah did not have God's blessing when he was doing those things. All the people in the temple, they were condoning Hananiah's message. They thought that he was right. They thought he was true. But even though this false prophet had the applause of man, he did not have God's endorsement. Number two, 
a quality of godliness is that of discernment. God's people should be able to accurately discern what is true and what is false. And we can sharpen our level of discernment by faithfully reading the Word of God in our lives daily, as well as by choosing to listen to those who can accurately teach and preach the Scriptures. I'll tell you this, that for those of you who invest an hour before the main service, week after week after week, right here in Sunday school, this is a great opportunity for all of us to sharpen our discernment. And over time, there's a huge investment here. Um, It's just, it's incredible. Number three, we are making a big mistake if we allow our feelings to dictate what is truth. Uh, Hananiah's message, it sounded good. But at the end of the day, what he gave the people in Jerusalem was a big, fat, nothing burger. That's what it was. It was a nothing burger. There are a lot of pastors They give their congregations nothing burgers on Sunday morning. We need to ask ourselves, is what is being taught and proclaimed from the pulpit biblical? Number four, just because someone may look religious, may have come from a respectable area, or may have a godly heritage, does not mean that they themselves are godly or can even discern what is true and what isn't true. Hananiah came from a respectable place. He looked the part of someone who would uh, who, could, who would receive a message from God. And he even sounded like someone who did receive a message from God, but we are foolish to think that someone's credentials are what makes them godly or discerning. Apostle Paul testified of this in his own life before coming to faith in Christ, Philippians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. He speaks of his life before he came to faith in Christ. He says, "...circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin." A Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, which is the law, found blameless. Yet he counts all those things to be law so that he might gain Christ. Just because someone has a flashy ministry, a good story, or even a great resume means nothing when it comes down to what they actually teach. The question is, can they discern what is appropriate or not? And finally, the fifth lesson is this. When we reject the light yoke of God's will, we end up wearing a heavier yoke in our own making. When we reject the light yoke of God's will, we end up wearing a heavier yoke in our own making. Just as God told Jeremiah to wear a yoke of iron after that wooden yoke was broken beyond repair, when we choose to live a lifestyle of sin, we are actually wearing a heavier yoke Uh, that we have made for ourselves. I've said it before, I'll say it again. I believe that one of the most miserable people in the world are carnal believers, uh, those who are lukewarm in their faith. It might be comfortable for a while. (laughs) Living on the fence might be comfortable for a while, but uh, over time, it it begins to bring with it a heavy yoke uh, that we're not meant to carry. So since it is serious business before God, when one decides to tamper with his word, the best thing we can do is to draw near to it. I'm reminded of Jesus' words from uh, Matthew chapter 11. We looked at that in our last lesson, verse 29, where the Lord says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Let me uh, close in a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed this morning. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this day and for this opportunity that we've had uh, to look into this 28th chapter. And uh, Lord, as we go through the week, I pray that we would be individuals who would seek after you, who would seek after your word, and uh, would seek to apply it to our lives. We thank you for that privilege that, we, that is ours, and we thank you for your word, that you've given it to us, that we can know you in a deeper way now. In your name we pray. Amen.